We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. As social media works too, I'm everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to go through the website. That way they end up in my email inbox as well as getting a notification on uh, WordPress. I'm not going to say no, though, to a question asked anywhere, whether that be Twitter, Facebook, you, me, social, WT, social, or you know what? If you happen to see me uh, in the streets on Windsor, just go ahead, hit me up. I'll answer your questions right there. Just stay six feet apart. Well, today we've got a couple of questions dealing with the same topic. First, right. a question from Corey Christensen who asked, if you had to remove a game from your collection, which would it be? Okay. Then, Yuhu Rutila asked the question. Filling up the first closet is something that every hardcore gamer and collector faces at some point. Then starts the negotiation with your better other about getting more room or selling some of the games away before new purchases. What tips would the Tabletop Bellhop give for selling some items from that precious collection? When to let go of a game? Just the number of plays? Or do other factors affect the decision? How about a rare collector's item? Where and how do you sell your used games? How to find the correct price? All right, so both of these excellent questions, thank you both, are, are dealing with culling a game or games from your personal collection. Now, Yuho is also asking about pricing and selling games. And personally, I think that's actually a second, a second topic. It's an equally valuable topic. I think it's worth talking about, but I think we're going to leave that for another episode. I think that could, that might be our two in two weeks time. We'll see actually in two weeks time, we're on our hundredth episode. I don't know if we want to talk about selling games on our hundredth episode, but it's still, it's, it's one. I'm definitely going to keep that one. It's going to go in our back pocket. I've kept it on our list. So I actually like copied the Yuho's question twice because we're covering part of it today. Because what I want to talk about today is what games to get rid of. If you ever find yourself in the need to thin down your game collection and by game collection, I am talking all types of tabletop games. Like everything tonight, I can't think of anything that's specific to a specific type of genre. We're talking board games, card games, miniature games, your miniature game armies, your RPGs, your story games, any type of gaming. I think all of these are equally valid or, or useful information for all types of gaming. For the record, if we are going to talk about pricing, I think we're going to bring in the power of our more quiet <laughs> member of the Bellhop team as Anshi Games does amazing work every year pricing the huge pile of games for our Extra Life auction yeah. uh, based on her history as a seller of games and memorabilia uh, as her main job. Yeah, at one time, definitely. So first off, um, I, I'm going to answer quickly the question. They said, which games would you get rid of? I actually have a pile behind me. I don't know if you can see these here. Oh, there's a pair of, ignore the pants. So we've got Going, Going, Gone, because uh, it's a dexterity auction game, a little too silly. we got Kalido. It's an older Martin Wallace game that I don't play much anymore. I've got Aeon's End, and it's because it's the first printing, and they put out a new printing of the game. So there's three games that I'm getting rid of. There are some more back here. So just examples, because uh, the first question from Chris was, what would you get rid of? Well, there's some of the examples. Now, why you would get rid of them we'll talk about in a minute first off though i do want to at least for a little bit talk about why you might want to get rid of some of your games or need to without looking at exactly what to get rid of and one reason i want to do this is because the reason you are getting rid of games can very much factor into what you choose to get rid of now we aren't going to get into any personal issues here if your partner hates your games or anything like that, we aren't therapists and we don't play them on TV. <laughs> Though I don't think on the list we have my wife hates it. That, no, that could I, I, be there. Or very, my very significant we, other. Yeah, we're, we're trying to stay away from that. Yes. You know, that I, I, yes. <laughs> yeah, we'll just stop. <laughs> All right. So, so one of the ones just based on Chris's question, I'm assuming Chris needs money, right? Uh, which again, we're not going to talk about where to buy and sell. This is a full topic for another day, but you might need to sell your games to pay for more important things. And the important thing here is that gaming is very much a luxury. It is a luxury item. You don't need games. They're not going to protect you. They're not putting a roof over your head. They're not going to sustain you when you're hungry. Uh, they are a luxury item, something you do for fun. And if those other parts of your life are suffering, getting rid of the games makes sense. Absolutely. You, you know, 
money money is important and especially right now in this strange world we live in uh there are a lot of people who are just out of work uh there's you know the economy is is in a poor way right now and uh food on the table trumps everything yeah um be honest you know so you can always buy more games later when things get better yep all right next one you're out of room uh, this could mean a few things like uh, you have too many games. You have nowhere to put them. You're remodeling. You're, you, you suddenly uh, have someone new in the household. Uh, trust me, there was a lot of rearranging once I had kids, uh, both because I needed space to put the kids and the fact I didn't want certain games low enough for them to be able to reach. Or um, you may be dealing with an aging parent or someone moving back home or your kids have gone away to college and they come home, depending on your period of life. Uh, you're moving to a smaller or bigger place. Uh, you may be out of room. Absolutely. There, there are a million different reasons why the space available might change. Um, and, and it isn't always just because you keep buying more games and run out of space. Uh, the actual physical space you yes. have available to store games in is something that is flexible as life moves on. Um, and and it's, it's something that you need to to watch out for and plan for also uh you know if there is an aging parent in your family that may end up having to come move with you you might want to think about the fact that if they're moving into the spare bedroom in the future and you right now have that entire spare bedroom as your game room mm -hmm. where is that gonna go <laughs> yeah planning ahead having having a spare room just seems like every, something everyone should do not something they ever taught me in school <laughs> you should just you never know what's going to happen. Yep. All right. Another reason you might get rid of games is you don't play them. Uh, this happened to many of us. I found once we hit university, we just stopped playing games and went away from the hobby. And some of us really regret selling what we had then, and others are really happy they held on to what they had then. Uh, but you may not be playing games as often. And this could be for any number of reasons. Uh, again, one of the big ones is your family changes, uh, whether that's someone moves home or you have kids or your family grows or you get married. Uh, your gaming group moves on. Uh, you finish school. People get real jobs. People get married. There are so many reasons why you may not be playing games as often as you'd like. Or yeah. maybe you just aren't even interested in playing anymore. Yeah, it, uh, gaming can be, for many people, a period of life thing. Uh, maybe you got into RPGs uh, in high school and, you know, bought bookshelves ver uh, full of them. And then you went to university and whatever your major was, you don't have time for that anymore. And you don't have yeah. any space in your dorm room for it. And your parents are trying to turn your bedroom into a sewing room. You know, mm -hmm. there's there's a whole lot of different things. Or maybe it's later in life and you've you've had a great long career of playing games, but you're retiring. and you want to keep a couple of games around to, that you really deeply enjoy, but the rest of it needs to move on to better homes, maybe. Yep. Uh, here's a one that some people may not think of, but I happens a lot. We, we have a really large gaming community here in Windsor, which is pretty awesome. And someone else already owns all the games. Like, you don't need to keep your own copy if you can always play someone else's or a new gaming cafe opens up, right? Gaming cafes are sprouting up all over. Uh, many of them, unfortunately, aren't doing well with the local pandemic, local, the global pandemic, local one too, I guess. Um, but it is becoming more and more common to be able to play games outside your home. You don't need to own them if you can go to the local game store to play them or go to the local cafe or the gaming cafe and play whatever you want there. And then you don't have to worry about maintaining them or anything. They're all taken care of. Or you have that friend that's got the huge collection of a thousand games. Why do you need your collection of 50 if you can always play theirs? Someone else has the games, so you don't necessarily need to have them yourself. Absolutely. Uh, I really don't need to buy any games uh, as long as I can get down to Windsor. <laughs> uh, other than other than a few games my family uh, and I enjoy together, there's really very little per point mm -hmm. in me purchasing all that many games because I'm going to play them in Windsor anyway. And uh, out of the thousand games in the Bellhops tabletop, I've probably played about 50 of them yeah, at best. Yeah. I mean, at best. At yeah. best. Uh, so... Now, what are the big ones? This is the one I see the most often people online, why they sell and get rid of their games is they're moving and they don't want to pack and move everything. Uh, this would probably be a big one for me. I personally own enough games. I never want to move again in my entire life between my games and Deanna's books. 
I just don't want to move. The, the house would have to be falling apart and falling down, I think, before we left, just because I don't want to move all that stuff. And if we did have to, oh, there would be a purge. There would be a large purge, I think, before that happened. Yeah, no, it's uh, moving. Moving is a tough time, but it's also a fantastic time to call the herd uh, yeah. to 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 clean up, whether it's uh, USB cables that you've got sitting in a milk crate somewhere <laughs> oh, yes. or your games or your books. Yeah, there you go. Um, you know, <laughs> we all have something in a drawer somewhere or in a shelf or in a, you know, somewhere that we have been throwing and keeping just in case. Mm hmm. And moving is both a great time and a painful time to clean that up. Yes. Um, you know, if I had a dollar for every DC power <laughs> converter I've got in my closet, among other things, uh, I'd be, I'd be buying a whole lot more stuff. Uh, I'd be yes. buying a whole lot more dude. Uh, I, I think I think that the the cable box is is the kitchen junk drawer of the 20th century. Yep. All right. The, the one thing that's important to note: uh, these are there's probably other reasons we missed. For one, uh, second is all these are valid. These are valid reasons to get rid of games. Don't feel guilty for getting rid of games. Sometimes people can get attached to things, and the the collector urge kicks in. Fight it, right? There's no shame in culling or curating your game collection. You don't need thousands or hundreds or even 10 games in your collection to be a real gamer. You just have to enjoy playing games. Absolutely. Remember the bellhop's first law. The best games in your collection are the ones that actually get played. So let's get into the nitty gritty of picking what to get rid of. Mm -hmm. Now, everything we talk about on this show is pretty much subjective, yep. but it is more subjective than usual. Everyone is going to find their own reasons to select which of their games to get rid of. Mm -hmm. What works for one person isn't going to work for someone else. And we just hope this list gives people a number of things they can take into consideration when curating their personal game collection. All right, the first one. Uh, these are in no particular order. They're in the order I thought of them when working on show notes over the last couple of days. So the first one, I want to bring up the Jones theory. We have talked about this one before. Uh, back in 2009, Cody Jones from the Game On podcast suggested a theory for game collecting, something he very strongly believed in. His theory was that you should never have more than one game of a single type in your collection. For example, if you play worker placement games and you already own Kalis, you shouldn't also pick up, say, Lords of Waterdeep, unless you pick up Lords of Waterdeep to replace and get rid of Kalis. Now, personally, I think Cody's taken it a little too far. I think this is a bit over the top and ridiculous, but the idea that one game can Jones theory another, to me, is valid, because over the years... I will often find that one game that has something in common with another game mechanically will do things better and that I pretty much never feel like playing the original game anymore. Now, the example game for me would be Dominion. Once games like Star Realms and Ascension came out with the rotating market of cards in the middle and multiple resources, I found I pretty much never had the desire to play Dominion anymore. Now, I didn't go full on Jones theory, because if I did that, I'd only be allowed to keep one deck builder. And there's no way I'm going to do that, because I have a number of different deck builders in my collection, all that to me scratch different itches. Now, my current favorites being Clank and Tyrants of the Underdark nowadays. But I got to admit, I can't remember the last time I played any version of Dominion or even Trains, which many people considered a Dominion killer. Even that's long in the past for me now. So I think the idea of games that have been replaced by similar games is an extremely valid way to curate your collection. And this is probably the main way I curate my own. So indeed, I think the, the level one takes this to is important. Uh, I'm not going to give up my DC deck builder just because I have a Harry Potter deck builder because they scratch different itches. Uh, yeah. Even though they are both in some ways very similar, mm -hmm. um, they just do different things for me and, and my family plays them differently. You know, I can, I can get different people in the family down at the table with them. Uh, but I wouldn't buy a new copy of Yahtzee just because it was a different theme than my Dr. Who Yahtzee. Uh, that's just ridiculous. Cause I mean, it's Yahtzee. It, 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 there's, there's really nothing. You, you need one version of Yahtzee. <laughs> so, you know, that's what, uh, 
the game the game doesn't change you know if you're buying a different version uh monopoly is one of those games where you could argue multiple copies because there are now some newer versions that are doing different things but even that's a bit of a stretch and really yeah. if you've got more than one monopoly in your collection you're probably doing something wrong anyway so <laughs> I, I it, to me for I I don't enjoy any version of Monopoly I've tried, but it would have to do something different. It would have to have a new mechanic. So for example, Monopoly Risk actually has a thing where like if the fellowship gets to the end, the game ends. So at least it has something. Oh no, no, not Monopoly. So what did I say? Monopoly Risk. Wow, that came out wrong. Lord of the Rings Risk. I actually like because you're playing Risk and it's on the Lord of the Rings map and it's pretty much Risk. But there's a time track where if the fellowship gets the ring to Mount Doom, the good guys win, which adds that new level to it so it's not just risk right or risk legacy versus risk i i get but if you're just buying i don't know all the different versions of risk or monopoly that that gets into collectors and i gotta say this is not an episode for collectors except nope. for the fact that maybe look and figure out why you're collecting so much stuff and maybe second guess some of that collection but collectors are different than board game players yeah if we're, we're talking we're definitely talking here about games to be played uh yeah. not that uh you know that mint in box game exactly. that is going to sit up on a shelf until it's worth a thousand dollars 50 years from now that's, and most that's a... board games that never happens yeah there, well, there partially because exceptions. of jones <laughs> Part, yeah. partially because of that uh uh well, yes the the, the fact that new versions of games tend to be better than old versions and the uh mechanics are constantly evolving and usually in a positive manner and in a good way new versions of games tend to be better and new uses for mechanics tend to jones theory out old versions and generally i mean for board games unless you've got components that are going to become valuable in it yeah it's you know it's if you there, there are right. exceptions of yeah. course to the rule look at dark tower and look at a uh, hero quest but again which... component uh components play a large part of dark tower that's true yeah um, dark tower in particular so again it, a lot you really have to i mean you need to know your market if you're going to get yeah. up collecting and then you should know whether or not you're calling or not so <laughs> that's true and that gets into pricing and that was that other topic so back yep. on track um uh, one of the other things one of the biggest ones i again look at when i'm calling my own collection is when's the last time you played a particular game now this is a lot easier for those of us who use board game geek or some other type of software to record your place um also for people who do things like box topping i don't personally know anyone that's it's box topping but this is where you write your plays in the top of the box so you could look and see when's the last time you played your games uh we also talked when we were talking about organizing your collection by using post-it notes to mark when you played a game and then you can look at which ones and every month you switch colors and you can look at your old colors but whatever the whole thing is that if you haven't played in a game, a game in your collection for a very long time, ask yourself why. Uh, look at the game. Do you want to play it right now? Like, are you looking at it? Do you want to go play? If no, that's probably a good candidate for culling. Now, for me, this usually happens when I look at a game I haven't played in a long time, and I will find a reason why that's perfectly valid, right? So I'll have games I haven't played in a long time that I keep, and there's a reason for it. Like, for example, a game I only play with my family at Thanksgiving, right? Which for me is Ticket to Ride. I'm not a huge Ticket to Ride fan, but my extended family love it. So I keep that game to bring out that once or twice a year, if it even gets out that often. Or is this the perfect game for an intro game night with kids? Because I run local events here in Windsor. So I will keep a game that there, I have no interest in playing whatsoever, but I like to have on hand when we're, we're having, like, say, our extra life event. And we know we're going to have kids coming in, younger kids. Though I rarely play the game myself. But other times, I'll look at a game and I can't find a good reason why I haven't played it. Like, huh. And sometimes it's that simple. Where it's like, no, I, I haven't played this in two years and I don't want to play it now. Let's just get rid of it. More often, of course, it's in between, right? I look at the game and I go, huh, I wonder why I haven't played that. And usually, I'm like, oh, I remember, that was a good game. Why haven't I played I should dust this off and play it again. And that's where I personally give games one chance. It's, it's, it's a one and done. I, I will dust off the, the game. I'll put together a game night. I'll convince Deanne to play. I'll play with the kids. I'll get people over well, again on a normal time of year. And we'll give it a play. And then if I enjoy that play, it'll remind me why I had the game on my shelf, why I bought it, and it'll stay in my collection. No problem. But often that final play will remind me why I haven't played the game in so long. And at that point, it's time to get rid of it. Yeah, and sometimes that replay is just really important. Human memory is intensely fallible. 
And there's a very good chance that if it's been sitting on that shelf for a long time, you're completely misremembering your fondness for a game mm -hmm. that's sitting dusty on the shelf. Seeing it again in a new light can really bring to light issues you glossed over in your mind with that last play. Uh, maybe the game was only fun because of the people you played it with mm -hmm. at the time. Even bad games can be enjoyable in the right setting with the right group. But is it worth taking up the shelf space in hopes that that magic moment will be reignited? Another one, really simple. I, I probably should have had this first. As I said, I wrote this list in the order I thought of them, is the game just isn't fun or isn't fun anymore. Uh, this definitely is the biggest reason to get rid of a game, right? Sometimes I break out a game during game night and it flops. It just goes over terribly. Uh, sometimes that's a new game I picked up. I didn't do all the due diligence beforehand or I grab something where there's a ton of hype and I don't necessarily agree with it. Or nowadays I get a review copy of a game and it's not something that I ended up actually enjoying. Often though, it's an older game that I've had in my collection for some time that I haven't played recently, which kind of goes into the last section. If you find yourself playing a game and not having fun, that's probably the best indication of all to get rid of it. Now, before you do that, I do suggest this. We've mentioned this a few times on the show before. Review the rules. Make sure you're playing properly. Uh, more than once, I've had a totally terrible game experience, wondered how people could love a specific game, only to learn the reason it was so terrible is that we were playing it wrong. And make sure you're, you have you are playing by the proper rules and it's not the game's fault. It's the game's fault that it's bad, not your own that you're ruining the game. Yeah. So it's worth noting that sometimes if you're always playing a game extreme and not enjoying it as a result, maybe the game doesn't lend itself to your style and should still be considered in the culling, even though you haven't been playing it properly. Sometimes that, that regularly playing it improperly is a sign that, Either the game is has got a problem, and, and it, may, yep. it may be a rule problem, but it may not be the rule problem. It may be your group just doesn't want to play games in the mm -hmm. style of that game. And so you, you just tend to automatically drift into a certain way of playing yep. that that game's fighting you on. Yeah, if you find yourself having to house rule the game, to me, that's find a better game like in my opinion i am not someone who enjoys house ruling i i, I again we're talking role-playing games are a little different here than, than board games board games in general i won't house rule i'll just go play something other else than, rules other than certain beer more. games yeah there's certain, <laughs> i said in general there's always the exception all right here's a reason you may want to get rid of a game the game itself or possibly someone involved with the production of the game is problematic we live in a world right now that's undergoing a lot of social change. A lot of us are learning about the privileges we have and how that impacts those around us. We're learning about things that we used to think were cool that actually, when you dive into them, are actually quite uncool. Now, this is a learning process for most of us, including Sean and I. Uh, being 40-something white men, we probably have more privilege than most people on the planet. Some topics that we used to think were okay in gaming can actually be quite problematic. And you may no, want to, no longer want to play those games because of it. Also, with a lot more voices coming forward with reports of mistreatment, harassment, and abuse, it's now become quite common to learn that someone involved with the production of a game is someone you no longer want to support. All of these are very valid reasons to remove a game from your collection. Now, many people might argue that we're talking about erasing history or cancel culture or hiding from truths, and I cannot disagree more. A game that offers a chance for discussion and learning about historical facts involved in, for instance, the British colonization of an area and its effects on the indigenous population mm. has absolute value. That is history. While a game that slaps a Britain and France fight to control country X Theme on a game, ignoring the plight of the country and the indigenous peoples just isn't valid. It's just a cheap excuse to slap a, th a theme on, on a game that probably an unnecessary theme. It doesn't teach and it glosses over real hard facts about periods and events uh, because those people might have been, you know, the designers might be uncomfortable with talking about those, those topics, but then don't talk about them. Don't introduce them into the game. Yeah. Uh, and at this point, 
don't support the games that, that aren't willing to talk about it, real issues. Next up, going to space. The game itself takes up a lot of room. Now, this is going to matter the most for people moving or running out of room. Uh, sometimes a good way to pick what will go is to find the game that takes up the most room. Now, there is one side track here that I think it's a little off topic, but I think is worth looking at is one of the things you can do if a game's taking up a lot of room is make it take less room, which is take games in big boxes and put them in smaller boxes. Um, she, unfortunately, she's not in the chat room tonight, but our friend Danielle and her husband Owen have these photo cases that they picked up that are awesome. They are for holding photographs and they hold 16 separate little packages to hold them all in a nice big case and they are managing to fit 16 games in each of these and their trunk now has three of those so like they're bringing i'm not doing the math at 16 times three off the top of my head they're bringing out a ton of games in a small area and no getting rid of board game boxes is not a crime i've done it you can do it too just break them down put them in the recycling with the rest of the cardboard now back to actually getting rid of games though I will admit I've done it. I have literally looked at my shelf and went, wow, that is a big box. Okay, here, I'll specifically call it out. The original Italian printing of Planet Steam. This makes Fantasy Flight coffin boxes look small. That box did not fit anywhere. I literally had it on top of my bookshelf because it was the only place it would go and it still overhung like three inches. This was just taking up a ton of room. And while I like the game, it's okay, Planet Steam, it's, it's Mule the board game. I didn't love it. So it had to go. And there it went into an extra life auction where it raised some good money for the children's miracle network. So I also, oh. yep. Yeah, no, I was going to say that. I, I think we really missed an opportunity here. Okay. You should have ogre behind you. I could. Yeah. <laughs> that one's, that one's on my floor in the other room. <laughs> That's true. That could have been behind us. Yeah. Now the other thing is besides taking up room on your shelf, besides like taking up physical space, games can take up too much room on the table. Now, I personally don't have this problem, but if all you have to play on is a coffee table or a fold-up table, or even a smaller kitchen table, having a copy of Twilight Imperium 4 in your collection might not be very useful because you're never going to fit it on that table. Yeah. So, I mean, I've gotten rid of all my DC deck box or uh, builder boxes because I got the, the expansion designed to hold all of the different decks currently and in the future. Uh, at least for Aquaria. And and the amount of cardboard that was was crazy. I mean, yeah. I had like three shelves of DC deck builder boxes, even though some of them are small. Uh, a lot of the bigger ones just take up a ton of space and they're really unnecessary. Yeah, so for some pretty art, but nothing you can't find, you know, in a bunch of other places, including comic books, where you want where you want the, the pretty art. Uh, and so now it's down to one box that holds everything I've got, mm -hmm. plus, uh, you know, future expansions to go. Yeah, I know people have a hard time get rid of the boxes. I did at first. I think it's like ripping up your first card in a legacy game. Now that I've done it, I'm like, nah, it's fine. Well, Let's now you're mean about it. Now, now you do it. Now you do it to yeah. the camera and tease people. The only reason I keep expansion boxes nowadays is in case I think I may resell the game. If, I, if I'm not positive, I'm going to keep it. I often do it for campaign games because once I'm done the campaign, I'm not going to need the box anymore. But other than that, I get rid of expansion boxes. Another reason to get rid of a game is that it is no longer supported uh, out of print or whatever, no longer new content coming out, or there's a new edition. Now, this one is obviously far more common in regards to RPGs, role-playing games, and miniature war games, because, man, how many editions of Warhammer are out there now? But it does happen with the occasional board game. Now, again, I do have an aside. Just because a game is out of print doesn't mean you can't play it anymore. The uh, RPG police, the, the tabletop game police, aren't going to show up and get mad at you and arrest you for playing the second edition of the game when the third edition's out. That said, though, if you are into organized play or tournament support or new content games that require an influx of new content coming regularly, that can be a really good reason to part with your collection of whatever the dead game happens to be. So you may even be able to help to pay for a new edition you've backed on Kickstarter with the sale of the original uh, yeah. version from your own collection, for instance. But in this one, be really aware of the sunk cost fallacy. Just because you've already spent a ton of time or money on something in the past doesn't mean that you need to hold on to it to, to make that cost have a value. Yes. It doesn't at all. 
Uh, that cost is gone and done. Um, one other thing that, that I thought of just as you were discussing is games with digital content. Mm. We've talked about this in the past, and uh, uh, I, I was thinking specifically about the racing car app that just basically came back from the dead recently. Yes. Um, whereas, you know, some games are have apps or other digital content that may die, right? The servers are all taken down because whoever, whatever company went out of business or just mm -hmm. stopped supporting it. If your game relied on that app and it's dead now, that's a really good reason to get yeah. it out of your collection. Yeah, the, the biggest one that I can think of in the board game industry for that is Golem Arcana which was an app-based miniature war game where you had this special Bluetooth pen where you would tap on the miniature and tap where it moved, and it did all the math for you. It did all the line of sight and how terrain, and it supposedly had all these modifiers and did all this work for you, and it looked really neat. And that was one of the first where the app just vanished. Right. And anyone who has it now has a bunch of pre-painted miniatures, and that's about it. So, And there are others. There are other examples. Now, another reason you may want to get rid of games is you have no one to play them with. Now, personally, I find this the saddest reason of all uh, to get rid of games because you have no one to play with, but I get it. It happens. Uh, now, way back in July last year, we did talk about starting your own gaming club. You can find that in the blog or just tune in to episode number 51 of our podcast in the club. Now, I suggest trying something like that first, right? Uh, try to try to meet local gamers try to find players but you know what sometimes that's just not possible for whatever reason if the only person you have to game with is your best friend having a bunch of four plus player games is probably just going to be depressing even when you do have a regular group or there are local gamers around there may be games you can never find players for uh this could be for a number of reasons the, the, the one that always sticks into my head is uh collectible card games or miniature games right if no one else around you is playing corvus belly's infinity that infinity army is not going to get played or if no one else is playing the latest collectible card game out there and you you need other players to play with if there's no local players or no local organized play events you're probably stuck the same thing I find with super heavy games, right? If you're if you are a heavy gamer and the people that live in your area are into lighter games, you may not be able to get your food chain magnets, your high frontiers to the table. Or similarly, if you play forward like the super long epic war games, the the, the there's a, a war game out there with like a hundred hours of play to finish the campaign. If you're the only one that's into that, and just having the game on yourself doesn't help you. Not being able to find players is actually the reason my dad, who was a board game collector long before I got into it, got rid of his game collection. And it's a very good reason to remove some games from your collection if you can't find people to play them with. Yeah. Evaluating your own situations and likely futures is important. And again, as we mentioned earlier, don't let a rosy view of the past color, color the reality of now. Now, one thing we didn't take into account here and uh, is brought up in the chat room uh, is solo play yeah. uh, because neither neither one of us well you especially aren't big on solo play no, not really. now the chat room brings up a good point that there are a lot of fan developed solo play options for games so if you're having yep. trouble play, uh, you know finding someone to play a game there are options out there personally i found i'm not actually a huge fan of some of those uh for instance the actual uh the op put out a solo version of the harry potter uh board game during the uh you know, for, for pandemic sufferers. Uh, and I went through, I grabbed it and I went through the rules because I'm a big fan of that Harry Potter uh, deck builder. But I personally think it's impossible. Um, <laughs> go, without actually sitting down, going through the rules and understanding the game as well as I do and, and having, uh, you know, the, the at least one of the two expansions, um, I struggle to see how it would be even conceivable to win that game wow. based on their setup of the, of the initial hmm. layout. So uh, your mileage co may vary. Co-op games are supposed to be hard, so maybe. Uh, the thing here that, to me, that doesn't fit this particular topic, but maybe it is a, a good call that before you get rid of a game, see if there's a way to play it solo. Yeah. To me, that's more about curating your collection on the buying side. If you know you don't have local gamers around, try to make sure to buy games that play low player counts. Try to make sure you're getting the games that have solo plays. What is good to see is more and more games nowadays are coming with a solo play. So here is a trick 
when looking to try to look at your collection objectively and not just be looking at it with the, the rosy glasses and the, the fond memories, right? So you're going to look at each game you have in your collection and ask yourself a few questions. And the first is, do I want to play this? If someone asked me to play this right now, would I say yes or no? Would I sit down and play it? And if I didn't own this game, would I go out and buy it? If you're answering no to all three of these questions, it's probably a really good indication you're not going to miss the game if it wasn't in your collection anymore. Yeah. Now, if you review games and have your collection on BGG, this may be as easy as opening up your collection on the on the website, sorting by rating and looking at all those games below a certain cutoff level. For instance, if you follow the official Board Game Geek rating guide, mm -hmm. uh, if if it's below a five, it shouldn't be in your collection. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's very little reason to keep anything that you've rated below a five assuming yeah. you are following which everyone should follow those board game geek ratings are useless unless you actually follow the legend that's a different rant for a different yep. episode <laughs> we've done that I, we've done that rant yeah yes we have all right uh we talked about this and reasons to get rid of games but this is a little more info is someone else already owns the game if you have a regular game group or play at a local game store or a gaming cafe or involved in some form of gaming club it's highly likely that multiple members of the group own the same games. Now, often this is normal and fine because not everyone plays with the same people all the time or every week, but this is a great way to decide to get rid of a game in your personal collection. I particularly use this one ahead of time. This is what I use when I'm shopping for games. I will often talk myself out of buying something because I know I can play someone else's copy, but I have done it when culling my collection too. There is no reason for me to own Underwater Cities if I can call up Chad any day and set up a game night that weekend to play Underwater Cities. Absolutely. And well, sure, that other player may move on and you can get a copy. You can get a copy again, possibly at an even better price yeah. or <laughs> replace it with a newer version or a better game of that type. You know, if if you always played Dominion with your friend, now's the chance you can go out and get Ascension. <laughs> yep. Introduce them to a new yeah. game. And, and that's well, one of those things. If you have a tight knit group, talk about these things, right? Like it just doesn't make sense. If you're playing with the same people week after week, you should have a group collection in that way, unless you're the only one buying. Yeah. Anytime I'm going to buy a game in, with the certain people in the local community, I'll be like, do you own this yet? Yes or no. And if not, I'm thinking about buying it. Do you want to play? And like, have that conversation. It's worth doing. Yeah. And, uh, if you're always playing Chad's version, you're not playing yours. So yeah. not doing anyone any good. All right. Some board games are just too much work. Uh, we kind of hinted about this earlier when we were talking about heavy games, right? Uh, well, the hobby is generally about having a good time. There are a number of games out there that can be work or turn into work. Now, by work, I'm talking about a variety of different things and forms. Um, and what some people consider work, other players will consider fun. So uh, very broadly, things I'm thinking of here are the time to set up or tear down a game. Uh, the difficulty in learning the rules or the difficulty in teaching the rules. There are a couple games in my collection I almost never play because I'm always with new gamers, showing new people the games. And I don't want to go through the, the, the work of teaching the games. Maybe the game requires a level of rules mastery for it to be fun. Or a number of additional purchases need to be made to actually enjoy the game or get the most out of it. This is definitely true of most of the miniature games or card games. Uh, and when we're getting into miniatures, there's all the extra stuff, the ephemera that's required, like scenery and a four by four table and measuring tapes and all the other stuff to make the game enjoyable. Models that need to be made, painting that needs to be done. Or looking at RPGs, there are some RPGs out there that still require hours of prep before each session compared to games that can be played as soon as you pick them up. Anytime a game stops being fun and starts turning into work where it's, it's drudgery, it's something you don't look forward to doing, that's a good indication that you probably want to get rid of that game and move on to something you're going to find more enjoyable. So this goes back partially to space as well. Uh, if you only have your kitchen table to play on, are you not playing some games because the setup and takedown that can't be avoided and you need to eat every day? <laughs> yeah. Uh, are there accessibility issues that make the game one. a choice to play? Maybe the game isn't quite as accessible, but you've modded it to make it accessible for in whatever reason. I know Ryan does spreadsheets uh, and things, you know, 
but is is the effort it takes to play that modified version really keeping it uh, from play, getting played on the table? Yeah. Another reason you may want to get rid of a game is the game itself is in bad shape. Now, this can happen for a number of reasons from the game being old, uh, just getting old over time, moldy basements, hot attics, flooding, uh, just normal use. Cards get creased and boards bend and warp over time. Any number of things can happen to the components of a game to ruin them. Now, this could make a game unplayable, which in that case, just toss it. But it could also mean that you just never want to play the game because it's just kind of gross or it's depressing to look at or all the cards are just beat up. It's just in such sad shape. Games getting ruined over time is something that happens. And ruined games should be discarded and then replaced if it's something you still enjoy and it's still in print. If you played a game enough to ruin the game, that's probably a good indication that you should tip that company by just buying another copy. I know that's something I firmly believe in. I do not use card sleeves in general. And there have been games I have worn out. I've used the card so much. I'm like, ooh, that's in rough shape. And I bought a second copy of the game. Yeah, we've talked about protecting games in the past. We have an entire episode about, you know, what you can do to, to protect all the different things if you if you go that way. But despite that, things happen. Or maybe it was a hand-me-down. Those yeah. family games from the 70s that you have fond childhood memories of, but your parents put them in a basement 25 years ago and they just sat there unprotected. Yeah. They may be just ready to go and move on. Find a digital version, maybe. Yes, perhaps. Most of those games aren't worth playing anyway. You play them once for nostalgia's sake, then you get rid of them. You're like, all right, I did it. I played it again. All right, my final reason that I have for tonight, and we will be jumping to the lobby to see if they have anything we missed just after this, is you beat the game. Uh, You finished the module. You completed the campaign. You have done all the things. Now, while most board games are endlessly replayable, Many RPG products like modules and adventures are run through once and then you're done with them. Campaign games are the same uh, as are, of course, most legacy games. Also, besides like finishing the content in the game, it is possible that you or your group or someone online and you learned about it has solved the game. Now, this could be something like an escape room in a box where you only play it once and once you played it or a murder mystery game where you already know the answer. But it could also be a game where someone has figured out a winning strategy that works every time or an exploit or a loophole that no longer makes the game fun. If you've completed everything a game has to offer, there is no reason to keep it. Though I got to admit, I know there's no way I'm going to convince any role player to get rid of their old modules through this advice. I'm going to try, though, because for some reason, we just seem to think, oh, I got to hoard it. I, I, we, we played through Tomb of Horrors. I got to keep my copy of Tomb of Horrors. I don't know. I don't know what the thought. Like, am I going to run it again for another group? Like, uh, I'm going to lose my RPG group and I get another group and then I'll run it again. I don't know. I don't know what it is. But honestly, you can probably get rid of any of the stuff you finished. And I don't like there are so many new experiences out there. Gone are the days where only a couple of new good games are released every year. There are thousands of great games coming out. How like, or, and, and looking at D and D modules or RPG modules, like there is new content being put out constantly in, in both the mass market and the indie scene. Instead of trying thinking you're going to relive that heyday and play that module again, just find something new. There are plenty of new experiences out there to keep you busy without needing to, retell the stories that have already been told and again we're back into our sunken cost fallacy in many cases we spent so much time on this it would be a shame to get rid of it well why take a picture log about your experiences save those yeah. unless you're a dm for hire you're probably never going to run that again it's and what are the actual odds you're going to need that one obscure rule that was on page 67 in the sidebar about how to hang your sword above your bed safely at night before you go to sleep. (laughs) Take a picture. It'll last longer. (laughs) Well, well, that's it for our suggestions on how to decide what game or games to remove from your collection and how to better curate your tabletop game collection. We're going to head over to the lobby now and see if the awesome folk gathered there have anything to add all right of course the big question here is what did we miss what are other reasons what what have you done why why have you gotten rid of a game 
before. And I also, there was a ton of comments today. I gotta say, excellent looking chat room today. We had a lot of back and forth going on. That was awesome to see. Yeah, we got uh, Pennywise is mentioning that there is a game in his collection that's under a five because it was a gift from his mother-in-law, but she does check up and ask to play it regularly. So it does get to the table. It gets played. And yeah. and so, I'm, you know, that's fine. You know, as long as it's getting to the table, then it's got a reason to be there, even if it's uh, not the best game. Yeah, in the if, the, if the game is getting played, that's my biggest thing, right? Like we call it the, the bellhop slot. The, the, I, I, I should find the full version. It's been so long since I've said the it's full the version of it. It is down at the bottom. I'm trying to do yep. it without scrolling. But basically, it's off the top of my head, the, the whole thing to me is it doesn't matter how much the game costs, how beautiful the miniatures are, how great the components are, how good the art is, how much hype there were, how much the Kickstarter raised, who the designer is, how many people locally have it. All that actually matters is does the game hit the table? That is the games that are good. The games that actually get played are the best games in your collection. And anything you can do to get that game to the table more often is worth doing, which goes into why I think box inserts are worth it and well, why I think except, some people Except for sleep. you, because you never get a game. Yeah, I don't know. That's okay. Inserts. In general, box inserts <laughs> should be worth it. Most people, on the other hand. Uh, yes. I, I am cursed. If I buy, get a box insert for a game, I never play the game again. Except for Gloom. Gloom is the, the one exception Gloom that Haven, the rule. Yeah, yeah um, Gloomhaven. But yes, in general, that, that is the, the best games in your collection, the ones that get played. Now, interestingly, matter. there was a, a discussion here about uh, turning uh, box tops and things into wall art. Now, Fair that's enough. great. You know, if you have finished Risk Legacy or Pandemic Season 1 or, you know, you're, you burn through Gloomhaven and your map is complete, there are some great ways that you can display that stuff yes. without it taking up space on your shelf. Yes. Uh, so... Again, that is part of culling the collection. If you're turning it into something else, if you're re recycling it in some way, uh, then that is culling your collection. Yeah, it's it's still curating your collection. Ask your friends, because that's what happened to me, is I had a friend who wanted all my box tops. So I'm like, all right, cool. So I gave them a bunch of box tops. They did something artsy with them. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Doesn't Someone can really make use for it. Yep. Oh, right. Uh, uh, so the... There is the point. So one of the things, and we actually, um, it's one of the topics that Chris Nizak has asked us to cover, and I haven't felt comfortable doing it because I haven't been running RPGs, is RPG artifacts. And yes, there is the desire to keep an artifact as a memorabilia from a session. And I think that is why a lot of the RPG DMs keep their modules is that memory of we ran through that, we beat that, we did that, or I killed all the character, whatever it happens to be on the player side, the DM side. I think that's part of it, but honestly, I don't know. So RPGs, me, I will admit, RPGs, I'm a collector. Yeah. I, I play RPGs, but I literally collect RPGs and I keep them in. I have a copy of Ravenloft and it's in a plastic bag sealed and I don't open it up unless I have to, right? But that's collecting games is different. Than yeah, and again, we're, we've talked about the difference between collecting. But I mean, if you, if you aren't a collector, if you're just a DM or a player and you have beaten um, the, you know, Ravage on the Rhine or whatever the, whatever the, uh, <laughs> or, uh, what's the Reich? Uh, the, the death on the reek death on the reek if you're For done Warhammer. that game you know sure there are probably going to be a couple of rule clarifications or yeah. extra monsters in there you want but again take a picture put it on a blog PDF. post it out there pdf it there's a lot of ways to to keep it without taking up a bunch of space um yeah. and, and and for me or especially as the memorabilia concept it makes way more sense to share a blog or a facebook post or something that actually gets into the experiences and lets you remember the fun yeah. and the experiences more than just having a piece of, you know, a, a bundled piece of papers stuck on a shelf somewhere that you may now only see once a year. So just uh, jump into the chat. Pennywise noted that one of their, their not to buy rules, if others in the game group owns them or are buying it, they will not buy a game. Uh, Red Meeple Ryan also said I made the exception for a few games is the person who owns them isn't showing up at local events as often and there's an interest in playing those games and and they're not happening so yeah that's it that is that's the downfall right is is the, uh, the seller's remorse I guess that you get rid of the game and then you know I said I can always play Chad's copy of Underwater Cities well Chad moves away right it, it could happen unfortunately so there is that risk but again there's so many games out there well, and like there's if, also if the I never that, could play that one game again, yeah. I'm, there's no game in my collection that I would be devastated. I could never play again. There's just so many other games. But there's also the fact that if you sold it, 
you're probably going to be able to buy it for cheaper yeah. than you ever did before because that game is a year old or two years old or three years old yeah. and tabletop underscore uh, deals is yeah, a great place <clears throat> to find that game again at significantly reduced prices yep so, uh, ryan had uh, wish there's an example he'd wish he kept at astra when he did a call when he was moving uh astra is a neat game i did i called that one every now and then i think about trying that one again um people do not like cody's um what i jones the jones theory is not popular around here <laughs> which i totally agree uh again game stretch different it's penny wise notes that um keeping a multiple types of games because they scratch different inches i think that's totally valid it's when you play that game and you realize you're like oh this is a better version of yeah that's when you make that choice you're like wow this is a better version of x uh, an example of that tante coro is a better version of dominion because it has the chambering mechanic which is really neat way to call your deck and it's like how long do i keep that made in my deck before i chamber it for more points because i still want to use it well that gets totally jones theoried by tyrants of the underdark which has a so much cooler theme sorry anime fans but drow and intrigue and D to me is cooler than maid servicing me and I think that is a much cooler version because you have the inner circle where you can promote your cards into the inner circle, which is very similar to chamber rules. I no longer feel I any need to keep Dominion or Tante Coro now that I have Tyrants of the Underdark. Well, Ryan said earlier, you know, I choose to interpret the law as games with similar mechanism and gameplay experience with yeah. different themes. Uh, choose and keep one. Uh, and so that that's really the the big thing. Uh, if If the gameplay experience between mm -hmm. the two games isn't the same then it's not really a, it jones theory yeah, doesn't true. actually apply yeah. uh whereas if it's just oh look this is ghostbusters and this is the exact same theme with mm -hmm. something else painted on top or the exact same game with yeah. you know a different theme painted on top then pick one come on <laughs> yep now ryan also pointed out a really interesting thing the fantasy flight started to do is their newer editions of games came in smaller boxes and I will admit, I bought a new copy of Alhambra because it fit better on my shelf than my old copy of Alhambra. I gave away my copy of Alhambra as a contest reward, a, a board game blitz reward, because it was in mint shape. And I got a new version of Alhambra because it fit better on my shelf. And Fantasy Flight did that. So he's mentioning Planet Steam. I was talking about Planet Steam being this massive coffin box. When Fantasy Flight put it out, they switched the pieces to plastic. They reduced the price to like $20 instead of 160 And they put it in a box this big, which is great. So that is a reason you may want to get rid of a game too, is just to get a different version like that. So another example is like Descent Second Edition is no longer in a coffin box. A Room War Second Edition is now in another one. Yep. Love to find a new home for Battletech, the collectible card game. Don't need to hold on to it, but don't want to throw the cards out. Uh, we sold all our CCGs to the local game store. You may want to talk to your local game store. Yeah. Um, did I not say Golem Arcana when I was talking about the game with the app? I might have said the wrong name. Golem oh, Arcana is maybe. the proper name. I see talk about solo games. Again, check. See if there, there's a way yep. to play it. Yeah, and a lot of it depends on, on how much effort that is. I, find, I have found that a lot of uh, the solo games uh, really tend to be, you know, it, it's great if that's the only way you ever play the game. But yeah. you really need, you know, set up the, this, this, this way and this, that way and this, that way. And, and then if you want to go back and play it the other way, you've got to, you know, re, redo everything to get it back that way. Um, so I think uh, some of that solo stuff is great if that's the only way yep. you ever play the game. Otherwise, you get into that too much work. This is another reason we didn't have on the list. I just thought of one. Digital versions of games. Ascension is the perfect example for me. I will admit I did not get rid of my current Ascension, but I probably could. I haven't bought any new ones. So nowadays, many board games are getting converted over to app form or Steam versions or Tabletopia or Tabletop Simulator. There are digital versions of a lot of games. And some of them, I, I admit, mostly I prefer the physical versions, but some are actually better. Uh, an example for me, again, Ascension is so much easier just to pick which expansions you want to use, which promo cards, hit start, and then dial up Sean. Well, I don't dial him up, but invite Sean to a game. Like, I can play with people all yeah. over the world, and I don't have to shuffle that deck. I don't have to yeah, track I mean, the little beads. Trying to, trying to shuffle a 300-card exactly. shoot is, is not 
is ridiculous. Whereas the app, you just sit down and play. Just tap, tap, tap. It, play. It's just, and I mean, it's it's a good experience. The gap, the app yep. is well well laid out. Um, it is an enjoyable experience to play that game on the app. Um, whereas, and, and it's just taken away all of the unnecessary, mm -hmm. unenjoyment work to play that game. Yeah. Star Realms. I haven't bought a Star Realms expansion. I bought the, I bought three copies of the original set because you can play that game up to six players and i actually really like the admiral way to play so i own three copies but i didn't pick up colony wars i didn't pick up the gambit packs i didn't pick up any of those because the app's so good yeah. another example is small world i love small world on a tablet now it does not play well on a phone just because it's too small but if you've got a tablet pick up it's actually small world 2 is the app for some reason uh because they put out a someone had put out a, a, a non-official small world app and the name was taken on the Apple iStore, so they had to call this one Small World 2, but it's Small World 2, which is the original Small World. And just, it does all the math. It does, you just drag your pieces, like physically use your finger to drag it, just like you'd move your chips without having to count things and pick them up. And Small World comes with a ton of chits that are a pain to... It's easy to play because they come nice and sorted in a tray. So like to set up, it's easy. It's here are your guys, here are your guys, here you go. But clean up, oh, it's such a pain. Yeah, Humble Bundle is uh, is is what Pennywise is mentioning in the chat. Oh, yeah, absolutely, definitely. that's where you know I've got so many games uh, from from Humble Bundle uh, pickups that I, I can't imagine playing in real life uh, yeah. anymore. Like there's just there's so many games now that Asmodee has put out, especially or there's other yeah, games Asmodee, as well. Days but Asmodee of puts the 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 majority of them out. Where it's like, yeah, no, I mean one of the one of the few exceptions to that rule would be Terraforming Mars. Yeah, uh, because physical. our experiences and other people have said differently, but our experiences have been terraforming Mars is just not as good a game. Uh, despite the fact that you know, even if you ignore the fact that you don't get the expansions on the, on the online mm -hmm. game, uh, it's just a better game in person and it's faster in person, which is mm -hmm. weird for a digital game. Yeah. It's, it's being able to see everything laid out without having to click a million different things to see everything else. I would much rather play physical terraforming Mars. So yeah. there's something to add to the list. I'll, I'll be sure when I do up this on the blog post, I will add game has a digital version as one of the ways, one of the reasons to get rid of it. I did. Ryan is pointing out. There is the ghostbuster re theme of ghost fighting treasure hunters. Yeah, so we're talking was, that about, was, that was but that does not Jones theory, ghost fighting treasure hunters because the company that produced it made a the quality of the quality game version yeah. of the ghostbusters version for some reason they had just put it out at the same quality as the original i'd be perfectly cool with that yeah all right i think we're good yeah so that's I'm it for our, if you're good yeah that's it for our main topic tonight remember you can find lots of gaming topics and advice like this over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com just click on gaming advice at the top of the page uh, finally, just if you've got a gaming or game night question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or just fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com.